Good evening, everyone. My name is Kyle Jensen, and I'm the Director of Writing Programs at Arizona State University. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the third of four Tomorrow Talks events for the 2022-2023 school year. The Tomorrow Talk series places the thought leaders of today in conversation with the change makers of tomorrow, our students. Each distinguished speaker will explain how they use writing to address our most pressing challenges. This year, the series celebrates trailblazers. And in addition to Percival Everett this evening, we'll be welcoming sports journalist Jamel Hill in January. Tomorrow Talks are a student engagement initiative led by the Division of Humanities in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at ASU and hosted by ASU's Department of English in partnership with Macmillan Publishers. Our distinguished guest this evening is Percival Everett. Percival Everett is the author of more than 30 novels and story collections. Everett has won the Ivan Sandroff Lifetime Achievement Award from the National Book Critics Circle, the Dos Passos Prize, the Penn Center USA Award for Fiction, the Penn Oakland Josephine Miles Literary Award, the Hurston Wright Legacy Award for Fiction, the 2010 Believer Book Award, the Premio Gregor von Rezori, a Creative Capital Award, the BS in the Academy Award in Literature from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. He is a recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship. Everett is currently Distinguished uh, Professor of English at the University of Southern California. He lives in Los Angeles. This evening, Everett will be talking with my colleague, Ayana Thompson, who is a Regents Professor of English at Arizona State University. Thompson is an expert in Shakespearean studies specializing in race and performance. Unofficially known as the Othello Whisperer, Thompson is the director of the Arizona Center for Medieval and Renaissance Studies and creator of the Race Be for Race Symposium, an ongoing conference series and professional network community for schools of scholars of color. Thompson serves as a Shakespearean, Shakespeare scholar in residence at the Public Theater in New York and currently serves on the boards of the Royal Shakespeare Company, the Folger Shakespeare Library, the National Parks Arts Foundation, and Play on Shakespeare. In 2021, she was inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Please join me in welcoming Percival Everett and Ayanna Thompson. Percival Everett, you probably don't know this, but I sent you fan email when the trees came out. <laughs> and I said, don't reply to this. I just need you to know how brilliant this book is. So <laughs> it's such an Thank honor to be in dialogue with you. my email now. And <laughs> <laughs> so you get too many uh, fan emails. Is that what it is? <laughs> uh, no, I'm just computer illiterate as well as the book. <laughs> uh, I wanted to start by talking about what I perceive as the immense pleasure that you have in writing and uh, where you find that pleasure from, even when you're writing about what um, are often difficult and perhaps even traumatizing experiences. Uh, what what do you mean by pleasure? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I I just perceive um, there's some there's so much fun and joy, there's joy in the novels in the way that they're constructed and the language play and maybe maybe as a reader I'm perceiving that as a pleasurable writing experience but perhaps I'm projecting that too much on you. No, I mean in, in fairness, I I I, I can see that and, and I. I think that's what I, I seek when I go to work. I don't always achieve that. And sometimes it's really, really difficult to, to make it appear that way. But, but play is an essential feature of, of, of my work. Mm -hmm. um, if I didn't get to play, I probably wouldn't, wouldn't do it. Yeah, and I think the that is a through line through all of your books is the, the play and the playfulness. Um, and it reminded me of, of Glenda Carpio's book, Laughing Fit to Kill, which you're probably, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I wondered if you could talk about the way that Black humor addresses a Black American experience. Um, no, for, it goes back, I, 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 I think, to, to the, well, well, all oppressed people have employed humor as a way to endure um, and there, there was humor in, in, in the um, in the death camps and during World War II it's people. Um, and I think it's well. There's a photograph. I'll describe the photograph that I that I love. It's a photograph of Malcolm X taking a picture 
of Muhammad Ali as Muhammad Ali sits at a, a lunch counter and, there, and he and, and Malcolm and everyone around, are, they're all laughing. Um, and these are these were tough times, trouble times, but at that moment, they're happy. Um, there is, there is, as you use the word, and I think that's a great word, joy, and 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 being alive, and and at that moment, regardless of what's going on, and I think that's 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 important. That if if the world takes your joy away, then your then your life is actually taken. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I was wondering, I know that um, in reading uh, past interviews with with you, I know that you don't like to talk about craft or <laughs> or don't believe in craft in some ways. But I, I I'm, I'm curious. <laughs> I'm curious about your ear for dialogue and what you attribute your good ear for dialogue, because there are sections in all of your books where I feel like I'm almost hearing dialogue from a movie or something that it's or dialogue that I've heard on the street that it sounds that that right that real. Well, part of our, our uh, we're illusionist fiction writers and 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 playwriters and script writers. It's it's not real speech, and as soon as you you realize that you're not trying to create real speech, but real seeming speech, then then the sooner you can move forward with it. Um, if you and I were to... Wait, what is the difference between real speech and real seeming speech? Well, if you and I were to uh, memorize dialogue from our favorite novel and sit on a bus and act it out, people would think we were nuts. <laughs> um, it, it, would sound, it, would sound, it would sound awful. Uh, conversely, if, if um, we were to record... Uh, a really intimate conversation where we think we're we're addressing all sorts of profound things in our lives and then simply transcribe it, it would read terribly. Um, My job as a fiction writer is to create the illusion of real speech. Um, um, First of all, the person who is hearing this speech is sitting there holding a book. It's already artificial. As soon as, as soon as as soon as we open that scene, so um, and and um, and you, you only get better by doing it. There are no tricks. There are no uh, tricks of the language that allow us to create that illusion. Um, it's 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 practice in the same way that a close magician practices in front of the mirror, not letting you see the card that that she or he is um, is hiding. So I felt like you had clearly perfected it when I got to the end of the trees and read the long speech by Donald Trump. So I was wondering if you could talk about what your process was like for getting his speech pattern down. Um, I have to apologize because I, I, I have what we call in my household work amnesia. As soon as I finish a book, I pretty much forget it. I, I don't know much about the experience of having written it and and often if you were to um remind me of any particular scene it's very likely i would remember it <laughs> I, I um it, it, the, the, that particular speech um the the more absurd and and the more uh profoundly strange someone's speech is the easier it is to make seem real um you know, there's a. I have a rule about about um, about who can say what, and it's drunks and babies can say anything. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, when it came time to write that speech, the the, the world was open to me. I could say anything. Um, now, if it had been someone I had been writing, say from the um, uh, someone who was less prone to absurd statements <laughs> that would have been it would have been more difficult i would have had to uh, to attend more to uh rhythms and and um uh, uh colloquialisms that were particular to that person but 
when dealing with a cartoon character, it becomes pretty easy. Although I think you did get his rhythms down. <laughs> well, well and, again, they're, they're pretty. They're pretty simple. <laughs> <laughs> and even his moment of saying, "I didn't use that word." No, you were. <laughs> even though we just. <laughs> um, so back to I know, back to your thoughts on craft and and how you teach writing, since we have many students who are are in writing classes attending this event. Um, can you talk about how you focus on structure and style and how that informs or how you think structure and style should be determined by the story you want to tell? Um, well, you know, there's always the ongoing uh, uh, conversation about, um, about structure and content. Um, and nothing happens without content. Um, that that and understand and the way I understand the content that I'm addressing is what influences my my choice of style, and then my play with structure. Um, whether it's right or wrong, I convince myself that my, that whatever structure I'm adapting is going to supply another layer of meaning to the world that I'm trying to create. Um, I don't like the idea ever of doing something just because it's different or just because it's funny or a gimmick. Um, um, that's not interesting at all to me. Um, and the, the interesting thing about writing fiction is that there really are no rules. Uh, in comparing it to, let's say compare it briefly to poetry. If I, um, if I were to write you a, a 15 line sonnet, you would say, well, that's not a sonnet. <laughs> it's got 15 lines. <laughs> or if I didn't adhere to those uh, rather draconian rules about creating a villanelle, <laughs> you could easily tell me this is not a villanelle. But if I were to give you 12 pages of fiction, there's nothing you can say in, in argument to tell me that it's not fiction. Now, you may tell me it's not a very good story, or you may tell me it's not a story that you'd like to read, but there is nothing, there are no set necessary and sufficient conditions that you can point to as justification for your denying that it's a story. Mm -hmm. um, to me, what that means is I can do anything in fiction as long as I can sell it. Not for money, but as long as I can get you to enter that world and believe it. And so what, What's the what's the first day of your fiction writing class with your students? What do you what's the first step that you um, ask them to take with you? Um, well, first of all, I, I'm I'm not a great believer in workshops. I, I'm and but I, as I say that, I have to admit that I don't have a a, a solution to that. I don't know what one does in, in, in instead of them. I. I have a course that's called a theory course, for lack of any better description. And the first day I, I tell them, it's called a narrative form and fiction, narrative form and theory in fiction. Mm. And I tell them that it's, uh, it's a bullshit title. Um, <laughs> that, that my entire mission is to um, uh, uh, prove to them that there is no narrative form in the making of fiction. It's all, um, uh, it's all consequent. Uh, we, we look at fiction after the fact and, we did, and then we create the rules mm. for it. But when we're making it, um, it's fair game. Uh, I want to disabuse them of the belief that there's a right way to do it. Now, of course, if they're writing genre fiction, which I don't say disparagingly in any way, but it, what is true about it is that um, for the most part, though, of course, there are gray areas and gray boundaries, um, uh, they adhere to a certain set of criteria that makes them what they are. So there is a formula that you, that you adhere to to create a detective story or a romance uh, novel. Um, uh, but with literary fiction, th there is no such such thing. 
um, the, 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 the two forms, the two kinds of fiction mean to do different things. And I'm concerned with literary fiction for, and I'm talking a lot for two reasons. One is I can't help anyone write genre fiction because I don't know it. Uh, and the other is learning to write a particular kind of story will help you write that kind of story, but it will not help you write anything else. Uh, learning to write literary fiction might well help you write anything else that you choose to write. I've, I've read somewhere that you talked about um, some of your pieces being failures. And I wondered, um, like, do you talk with your students about failing at some of their, um, you know, what they're trying to accomplish and how, how to get past a failure? Oh, yeah, I man. Tell them if you want to be interesting people, you better fail at something. <laughs> <laughs> um, some of the, my favorite novels are, are, are they're, they're experiments that didn't work. Um, What's a good example? Oh, John Wyman's Philadelphia Fire yes. is a great novel. A great uh, but he inserts himself near the end of it, and I know what he's trying to do, and it doesn't work. But it's that it was it's that attempt that makes it a great novel. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, it, one could argue that um, my favorite novel. My favorite postmodern novel, which was written in 1741. Tristram, Tristram Shandy, my yeah. favorite. <laughs> I think everyone should read Tristram Shandy. <laughs> yes, I read it every year. It's, it's, a, it's a fantastic work. Um, uh, for no other reason than you're never given the story you're told you're going to be given. <sighs> it's, it constantly points out its failings. Exactly. And then, and then ends by telling you it was a good cock and bull story. <laughs> it's brilliant. Yes. I, I think for me, failure is so important in fiction and in, in training our students to think more capaciously that if you're not swinging for the fences every time, then what's the point? And what are, you know, fiction is fun, right? I mean, like there, there's real stakes mm -hmm. to it in terms of like you ha can have an impact on the world. But if there's not joy in trying to experiment with something, then I don't understand. I agree with you completely. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think of, um, uh, you talk about affect the world, uh, uh, a painting that I, I think of often in that way is, is Guernica. Um, uh, the amazing thing about the painting is most people haven't seen it, yeah. but it has affected it affected the world when it was made, um, and and the and the the painting itself is full of play, full of play on perspective and who's included and animal everything. Right? I mean, Picasso yes. was swinging for the fences. Yeah, yeah. Um, you have said um, on numerous occasions and. Um, and I agree with you, but I was hoping that you could expound a bit about it, that people were smarter about race and thinking about race relations in the 1960s and 1970s than we are in the 2020s. So I was wondering if you could talk more about why you think that's the case and how we get back to being smarter. Um, now, I don't know if, if people were, but certainly there were instances where the art was. Mm. Um, and I think part of it is 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 that um, uh, there was a acknowledgement uh, of difference. Uh, um, being a racist didn't come to seeing that people were different. Um, just as leaving racism wasn't going to culminate in becoming as the awful term colorblind. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there are times when you when when you describe people by their color, you know, he stole my car. He was a white guy, about 6'3", as part of the description. <laughs> that's going to happen. Um, it doesn't, that's, that's not racist language. Um, now to say there are white guys out there stealing cars is. <laughs> um, um, my example for this um, is Blazing Saddles. 
the, Mel the, Brooks. Mel Brooks, <laughs> the, Mel, the Mel Brooks film. And I and I I show it to my Western film class. I teach a course in the American Western, and 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 I and I show it with 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 uh, the disclaimer that though it's very smart about race, um, it's misogynistic and homophobic. They have to understand that it's got problems, and those are things to discuss. But as it addresses race, it's. Um, it takes on racism um, as something ridiculous. Um, uh, it accepts that it exists. Um, it accepts the world in which it exists, and 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 doesn't present itself as a cure. And so, when when these and and I and I'm convinced that much of the writing that that was written um, by um, Mel Brooks and and much of it was written by Richard Pryor. Um, uh, that there was not an attempt in this to solve any American problems. It was a depiction of American problems, and so in that way, um, with that, without, 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 kind of a, a fascist stance about being right about anything. Um, we artists, if, you, if you're looking to artists for, for, for some message about how to be in the world, um, you're looking in the wrong place. <laughs> we can talk about the world, but we don't have any answers. <laughs> <laughs> we can describe different worlds, right? <laughs> As well. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. So what do you think? Um, so the 1980s um, brought in our that weird language and rhetoric around colorblindness, which I think has stuck with stuck around way too long it passed its its overdue date. So where yeah. would you hope that we could get in our art, you know, in the next 10 years with regards to a, a kind of smarter approach to thinking about race in in the U.S. if we just limit it to that. Um, well, I, again, I, I'm 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 just a dumb writer. Uh, I, it's I think accepting that um, we're enculturated all by the same society, the same the same world, and and um, and. We're all racist and sexist, and, and, and until we sort of own up to that, that we're capable of that kind of thinking and behavior, there's no way of addressing it. Um, um, without doing the hard work of, of self-reflection, um, there's no way, you know, I mean, or it starts at home, right? Um, there's no way of, 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 of getting better unless we, it, Acknowledge the the disease. Um, so I, I think that's what that's what art should does for us. Um, um, I, I think in a couple of my works from mail I've received um, that I've caught uh, readers in their in their you know and you know, let's face it, my readership is not watching Fox News. The people who are reading my books are probably pretty liberal, and just to start with, but they've been caught by by um, the work. And one example being uh, in my novel *Glyph*. The clip there's a uh, a baby narrator, um, and around uh, maybe a quarter way through the the novel, the baby says, "I, you know, I'm I believe that up until this time you've assumed I'm white because there are no." coded markers to, to tell the the um the reader anything else um and there's no reason to think the baby is any race um certainly there's no reason to think the baby is white um maybe looking at my picture on the book is a reason to think the baby <laughs> might be black but the baby says i'm african-american and a lot of readers were caught by this and had to acknowledge that they had made um, that kind of presumption on starting the book, um, you know, and as a black writer, if you don't have your um, your character Coma's Afro or across Lennox at 125th Street, someplace in the first 10 pages, that character is white. 
Can I tell you my favorite bit in one of your novels is my pathology in <laughs> the novel within <laughs> Erasure, <laughs> which I just like laughed all the way through but also was like gripped by the story nonetheless. And I was like, why am I gripped by this stupid ass story? <laughs> no, it pissed me off too. Uh, <laughs> well, the frightening thing is, did it's it a horror novel. surprised you as writing it? It surprised you as, well, as no, writing it's, it's, it? The, the horror of the whole thing and the horror of the idea is that um, story has so much power. Yes. And, and, and things can be done to you that you don't know are being done to you. So those stereotypic images, you can be moved by a story and not realize that you've been brainwashed. And yeah, it's terrifying. I know you, I know you have work amnesia, but do you remember what it was like writing the novel oh, within Erasure? I hated going to work every day when I was writing <laughs> the novel there. Yeah. Did you feel guilty or? What you... That's a good question. I don't know. Uh, that, that, that's a really good question. I, um, and any answer would be my making it up now. So I, so, but I, I, I don't remember. Yeah. Um, I remember starting it. I remember exactly where I was when I started writing my pathology. Uh, do you know the poet Cornelius Edie? Yes. Yes. Um, I, I was, he was giving me a ride to Philadelphia and I just read a certain novel that had arrived at his house. And that morning I talked to my agent, just shocked that this had even been published. And, and she informed me that not only had it been published, but it had just gotten a huge paperback deal and a movie contract. I thought, oh my God. And in the, sitting in the back of his car, um, um, I, the first line about stabbing the mother came to me. <laughs> so I know exactly where that novel was born. The only thing you left out of Erasure that would have made my pathology, which then gets retitled another name that I, I we can't say here, but um, would be that Tyler Perry buys the movie rights. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I, <Yeah>. did, <laughs> I did think that would put a nice bow on. <laughs> if, if I if, if I had had my my finger more firmly pressed against the pulse of American popular culture. I might've done that, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. I think we should open things up to the amazing students who have much harder questions for you than I have. Um, so let me look to see who I'm supposed to turn to first. I believe that Courtney is going to ask the first question. Okay. Am I, oh, okay. Hi. Hi. Hi, my name is Courtney and I'm an English major. Um, so at one point in the trees, Mama Z critiques Damon's academic work about racial violence because she says it's quote, scholastic. Now Damon defends scholastic writing by saying that scientific precision might help generate outrage. Your book is biting and witty and not necessarily scholastic. So it seems to me that you at least partially agree with Mama Z in this debate. So first off, is that a fair assessment? And if so, can you expand on why it's important to break away from scholastic writing styles? Okay, first of all, Courtney, I expect you to be applying to our graduate program next year. <laughs> no, she's um, staying at ASU. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, that's true. I'll fight over you later. Um, I um, I have I, I don't I don't I, I don't have anything discouraging to say about scholastic writing about 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 academic work uh, exploring different subjects. Um, um, I don't know if I agree with Mama Z. I, I think I think she might well be commenting on the novel that you're reading um, um, as she's saying this to 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 Damon Thruff. Um, there, are, if you know. She mentions the length of 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 his his book, which is very close to the length of of the trees. Um, so it's it's more a comment about how studying something, regardless of how you study it, often results in a distance from it, and so um, and so diminishes the outrage that we feel on the initial discovery. 
I don't know if that answers your question. No. That does. If I could ask a okay. very quick follow up question. Um, that's from, I guess, the perspective of a writer. It's hard to be involved with something necessarily when you're writing it scholastically. From the perspective of a reader, do you think it's the same thing? Uh, readers are a lot smarter than writers in a way. Um, one thing is, is, is they get the material and they're remaking it as they read it. It's a lot like trans translators. I, I have a lot of respect for people who translate words from translate words from one language to another, um, because they're creating a brand new work. They have this material in front of them, and they have to find a way to communicate it to a completely different audience. Likewise, when you as a reader come to the work, you're taking everything that I've made and you're building on that. So the work has to be that much smarter than, 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 than what I've made. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Courtney. Um, next, we've got questions from JP. Hello, my name is JP. Hi. And I'm an English major as well. And I had a question pertaining to your writing style. And what are the challenges of writing about violent events in short form chapters, such as those that appear in the trees? Do short story chapters represent how quickly the public or the medium moves through and past such events? And does it represent how such events combine with one another at such a rapid pace and spiral out of control? To kind of sum it all up, I found your narrative approach evocative and would like to hear more about it. These, these are plants, these students. <laughs> no, the ASU students are the best That's students right. in the world, I'm telling you. <laughs> That's a great question, Jim. Um, um, you know, one of the things we see in our culture now is this, this, this um, uh, and I see it in my kids, this desire for immediate gratification. Um, uh, now it's, uh, it's probably 15 or 10 or 15 years ago, I was sitting in an airport next to this man, a grown, a gr a grown person who, who is trying to get online and he's so upset and he's swearing because the internet is slow. And I, and I, and I thought, well, five years ago, you didn't even have this. <laughs> And so this 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 need for these for these uh, this immediate understanding or this immediate product is interesting to me. Um, um, the and the way the American public, at least, consumes information. Um, um, I, I stopped looking at news on my phone. Uh, um, because once I learned I could look at news on my phone, I'm such a Luddite, but then I, because I realized I was reading these clips and, and I was consumed with this belief that I was informed. And then I started, um, I, I, I realized that all the news comes to us in this way now. It's all sound bites, it's all quick, um, and it's repeated. In, in these 12, 14 minute cycles. Um, and, and which might explain why what passes for political discourse is actually political polarization in our country right now, because that's what drives that kind of immediate response. So I was playing with that and what I think um, how television commercials work. In a television commercial, you have 15 seconds to tell an entire story. And if, if you lose someone in 15 seconds, um, that's a t then you're not doing anything. <laughs> but but to tell an entire story in 15 seconds is 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 there's something going on. And so I watch a lot of ads um, to try to get that rhythm of keeping things moving. And um, and, and so those short chapters. Uh, our play with our attention span. Uh, but there is a, an actual novel from, and I, I, from the 70s. It's not a very good novel, and it's actually not a novel. It's a book by um, Norman Mailer, and I think it's Execution of a Song, about the, this execution of a man named Gilmore in Utah who chose to be executed by the firing squad. But 
but the, the 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 subject of the book is not nearly as important as the fact that it was written in short paragraphs with spaces in between them. And and what it allows is it allows a person to read and achieve something any time they pick up the book. Um, and so that I was so that was something typographically that that I thought of. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks, JP. And next we'll hear from Erin. Hello there. My name is Erin. I am a communications major, so not an English major, unfortunately. Um, my question is, why did you create such drastically different diction and rhetoric between the money locals and the big city detectives? How did you want that difference to impact the reader's understanding of the story? Well, that's a fair question. I actually, when I first started writing the, the novel, I turned to my wife and said, I'm not being very fair to these white people. And then I said, well, I don't care. Uh, and basically, uh, I didn't care because uh, we were coming off a, a history of, of uh, well, let's say, uh, not 400 years of slavery, but 200 years of media that has chosen from the time of minstrelsy to depict um, uh, African American people as 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 offensive stereotypes, um, and 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 so I simply I'm inverting that, um, and so the the novel does double duty. It's it's not only addressing lynching, but it also it's also addressing a very American um, institution of, of presenting people and and. Um, uh, offensively cast stereotypes. Thank you. All right. And finally, we have a question from Evan, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Okay. Hello, my name is Evan, and I am a political science major here at ASU. And my question I have is, so when I read The Trees, it was a really amazing experience for me. I just wanted to read more books like it. So my question is, who are some writers that you respect or admire that address racism in complicated and thoughtful ways? Um, well, there, 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 are, there are many. Um, I think uh, Chester Himes and a, a number of his novels, in particular, I, I, I think of If He Hollers, Let Him Go. Uh, certainly, um, uh, Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man does. Uh, Zora Neale Hurston, uh, her, um, their eyes were watching God. <laughs> it does to some extent, but it's more about relations between men and women. But it worked its way into the into the book, uh, well, very subtly. Um, um, and then there are writers that that you uh, that we don't talk about too much anymore. Anne Petrie um, and and. Um, uh, uh, Gene Toomer, um, and Gene Toomer's uh, is called the novel. It's called the title is Cain. Might be considered a, a a collection of poems and stories, but uh, I I was taught it as a novel, and I and and I and it comes to me as a novel, so I will call it a novel. What do you think, uh, Ayana? So it's funny, it wasn't taught to me as a novel. Um, when I was an undergrad in college, it was taught as a poem cycle. So, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. So that's interesting. When you were saying a novel, I was like, I had to like recast back <laughs> into my mind how I was, how it was framed for me. But it, it did feel when I read it as an undergrad for the first time, revolutionary, like that you were dipping into this world that felt very complete, but in a kind of poem cycle way, the way it was framed for me. Okay, um, but there, like, but uh, Evan, I, I think that there's a wealth of, of of work for you to discover. Um, that's like that, and if and if you're looking for something that may be a slightly more in in line with mine, I would say John A. Williams' work, um, any of his novels. Um, one of them is, and I can, I'm trying to remember the title of it, um, is about. Uh, 
that involves time travel. It's about a, a, a soldier, a black soldier, who keeps waking up in different American wars. Do you, um, and I think I think it's maybe Captain Blackheart or something like that is the title. But his name is John A. Williams, and I think you would enjoy that. Thank you for the recommendations. Yeah, I, I'm not familiar with the author, but I'll definitely. That sounds like a really interesting story, and thank you so much for your time. Oh, thanks for your question. Okay, so from an audience member, we have this question. Can you please ask Mr. Everett who his favorite absurdists are? Anybody for humor or satire? <laughs> well, my sense of humor, my sense of irony is, is, is shaped by uh, one, my father, but then uh, Mark Twain, uh, Groucho Marx, and... Um, and uh, I hope you're ready for this, Bullwinkle the Moose. <laughs> uh, the first pun I ever fell in love with was uh, an episode of Bullwinkle in which there is a little boat that they're trying to, to find that's covered with jewels. And the boat turns out to be the ruby yacht of Omar Khayyam. <laughs> and, and so that's the way I approach, approach um, <laughs> writing. Um, Absurdist, uh, I, I think um, uh, the, the absurd stuff I like is, is fairly subtle. Um, uh, I don't, there, there are not too many books funnier than, than Mark Twain's Roughing It, though not fiction, um, his depiction of, of, of the West and, what's, and, and, and his movements through the West are, are really, really quite, quite, quite nice. Um, Ishmael Reed, Reed's work is, is, is out there, it's crazy. And, and I like the work of, of Kurt Vonnegut. I was one of um, Kurt Vonnegut's armies, army of 13 and 14 year olds. I got moved from the outfield to third base because I was holding um, Breakfast of Champions in my baseball mitt. And, uh, fly ball landed beside me, so baseball career started and ended at, at that ended right? pretty quickly, yeah. <laughs> I think Ishmael Reed's mumbo jumbo is one of the best it's but, it's hilarious yeah, it is yeah yeah okay um it, uh, uh, the concept of names the sheer number of names and titles to be written down becomes a major idea in the latter half of the trees what motivated you to establish that idea? Personal experience, historical significance? The idea of names? Oh, I love names anyway. Um, um, but names, the, the, what Damon Thruff feels when he's writing those names is exactly what I felt. When I, when I wrote all the names out by hand. Um, I did not write all 7,000 that I, or 5,000 that I found out by hand, I exaggerated in the book, but I wrote out a couple of thousand and it was a terrible experience um, because as I did write the names, they weren't just words, they were people. Um, I did not erase them as Damon says, he is going to in the novel. Um, Names uh, do a lot of work in the world. They can do a lot of work, just as titles can do a lot of work. If I had called the trees uh, just another lynching novel, it might not mean the same thing. Um, uh, though, as I say that, it's not a bad title. So <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, I was like, that's a great title. <laughs> yeah, that's not bad. Which I, only I thought that. Um, and I, and I noticed what names can do when I was um, a young adult. I had just started writing, and I walked into the Vietnam Memorial. And as I walked down, it, 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 it's, it's a, a, a slope downward into the names. And seeing all of the people down there looking for the names of their lost people. Um, 
moved me. Um, and 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 I and I realized what what names that that we are our names. Um, and so I, that's that's why I, I always hold on to that. What is the story of your name, Percival? Is that a family um, or? It, it is. My my father was a Percival, though I'm not a junior because he was named after an uncle. Um, my great grandfather apparently had some fondness for it, for the the tales of Arthur, and so his kids were Arthur, Percival, Edith, and Ethel. <laughs> So you also come from a long literary line then. <laughs> he was a Henry, so. <laughs> okay. Another audience member asks, I read your uh, book Erasure last month, and the main character was a greatly written writer. I know the book was released a while ago now, and it's okay if you don't remember all the details. How was the pro- process of referencing your own line of work for the main character of Erasure. Well, that's a that's a good question because I really hate books about writers. <laughs> um, and 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 as I say about this novel, it is not autobiographical, though the character is alarmingly similar to me. Um, but I I can say, though all fiction is in some way autobiographical, I don't write autobiography. Um, I don't really use the the stuff of my life as as, as um, material for my fictional worlds, um, but I I understand someone thinking that 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 novel might be, <laughs> or or that the you can relate to the outrage that the the main character felt about. The other yeah. black novel <laughs> that that was straight out of real life. <laughs> the other guy. <laughs> okay, and then another audience member asks, "Why are chapter seventy four and one hundred four missing in the trees?" Okay, it's people are book. asking that. Uh, <laughs> it's there were seventy four attendants at the Sermon on the Mount. I'm not religious at all, but I have lip religious illusions that I that I'm I'm capable of tossing in. That's one. I can't believe I'm actually telling anyone this, but and then the other one is mathematical, and and as everything comes down to arithmetic to me, and it has to do with the number of vertices, the 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 um, uh, the number of of points capable of being touched by all vertices on a plane. And I'm not going to explain it, but that's why 104 is there, and it's. It's uh, if anyone could, the puzzle would be for someone to figure out why that's important to me. <laughs> but <laughs> that's great. And can you tell us what stories are swirling around in your head that you want to tell and are searching for a form? Uh, I, I never know. Um, I, I, I play with stuff all the time. I, I, I really. I talk about this a lot and I and and I'm and and I don't think it's it's very satisfying for people. I, I think I should be able to write an abstract novel. I I um I'm a painter and so I and I love abstract paintings. And I know why I love abstract paintings. But when I come to work as a writer, the constituent parts of my art are representational. I don't and but I believe I should be able to make something that I consider abstract. Um, that's where I think I have failed a number of times because I've been trying to do that on any number of books. Um, and, um, and, and, and I think I've gotten close sometimes and then I stand away after it's published and realize not even close. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but I, I keep trying. <laughs> Um, okay, it looks like we might have one other question. Yes to Bullwinkle and Rocky. Jay Ward <laughs> is an underrated humorist. There is a most memorable episode of Peabody the Dog and his boy Sherman 
their origin story. First one in the series. Hilarious. So I guess it's not a question. Oh, <laughs> oh I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, uh, it's been such a pleasure talking with you and hearing your thoughts about um, about writing and reading and uh, your generosity with our students at ASU. And so thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. And, and those are great questions. I, I realize this is, this is just an opportunity for you to show off your students, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> you do. I've <laughs> done good. <laughs> Thank that was you. great talking to you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I think I'm supposed to say something. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. To, uh, look, I'm supposed to say the official thing. See, I was going to forget that. Thank you to Dean Jeffrey Cohen and in, the English chair, Krista Ratcliffe, for their support, and to Kristen LaRue and Bruce Matsunaga for their help organizing the, this event. Additional thanks to Peter Jansen and Byron um, Echeverria uh, from Macmillan Publishers. Sorry, Byron, if I mispronounced your last name. Finally, we want to thank um, our incredible ASU writing teachers who work tirelessly to help ASU students imagine a brighter future. Colleagues, you're amazing. Students, you're even more amazing. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Good night.